probably the day I was born. I, I must have had stars in my eyes. At 67 years of age, Jerry Cobb says she still has the right stuff to take part in a mission she says has eluded her for 38 years. Had I been born male, I would have um, been in the Air Force flying a test pilot and probably have made several trips into space by now. Despite that statement, Jerry Cobb is more a woman of deeds than words. So to understand her story, we need to step back to the dawn of the space age. The year was 1959. NASA had launched an ambitious program led by a group of dashing young heroes known as the Mercury 7. I knew aviation was a man's field, and certainly space was more so. And I was hoping and praying that uh, I would be able to be America's first lady astronaut. Cobb began flying when she was 12. She served as a pilot in World War II, and by the 1950s, Jerry had set four world aviation records for speed, distance, and altitude. But after all, Jerry was still a woman. As NASA's Mercury 7 underwent a battery of grueling tests, Cobb was privately invited to undergo the same test to measure a woman's suitability for spaceflight. The physical tests took eight days. It was a series of 87 different tests. And um, they checked everything you can imagine. Then, 29, Cobb underwent three years of tests and passed all three phases, doing as well or better than the men. I'm not competing with the men at all. I think that both men and women will be flying in space. When Cobb's results were made public, she instantly became a darling of the media. Then came the bad news. Jerry and 12 other women candidates were notified that all astronauts must be military jet test pilots. In those days, that meant men only. In 1962, Jerry Cobb took her case to Congress. The rules have been established to where it makes, it makes it impossible for women to meet the qualifications of astronauts. But NASA's decision not to consider a woman's space program was partly sealed on John Glenn's congressional testimony. Men go off and fight the wars and fly the airplanes. The fact that women are not in this field is a fact of our social order. I was disappointed that he felt that way, but uh, John Glenn is a friend, and uh, even though we differ on a few things, he's, he's still a very nice man. Certainly you were disappointed, but did you find unexpected rewards? Oh yes, when it became apparent that uh, the, my country was not going to send women pilots into space for a long, long time, I decided to use my talent serving others. She heard of John Glenn's orbit, America's conquest of the moon, the entry of women into the space program, and the triumph and tragedy of space flight. Cobb knows the risks, but has never wavered. I want to fly in space more than anything else in life. It just seems like what I was destined to do. But then came NASA's announcement that her friend, John Glenn, at the age of 77, would make a historic return to space. For Jerry, that meant hope. I'm asking for the same opportunity they're giving John Glenn. NASA spokeswoman Peggy Wilhide. She'd have to pass rigorous medical tests and do the exact same kind of training that Senator Glenn has done. He's been down in Houston for almost a year training specifically for this mission. So on October 29th, when John Glenn boards the shuttle Discovery, Jerry Cobb says she'll be close by, in body and in spirit. I'll be standing on the beach waving my friend John Glenn off in space. Very happy for him. And hoping for her chance to reach for the stars. Oh, that would be the fulfillment of my deepest dream. I would say thank you, America. Thirty-four-year-old Victoria Murden of Louisville, Kentucky, embodies an all-American spirit of adventure. But with her video camera rolling, her quest to push the limits of her own endurance nearly killed her. I've been thirsty and I've been hungry and God knows I'm scared. Normally, Tori is accustomed to racing on calmer waters. But in October 1997, she was approached by Sector, an Italian company known for its extreme no-limits competition. The challenge, to be the first woman to row solo across an ocean. The proposition was intimidating. To, to row the North Atlantic, uh, going west to east, is no cakewalk. 
On June 14th, Tory Murden took the first strokes in a 3,600-mile odyssey from North Carolina to France aboard a 23-foot boat she named the American Pearl. I knew that, okay, in the next three months, it's just me and this boat on this wide, wide piece of water. That is my dessert for the evening. Tori packed 120 freeze-dried meals and a solar-powered desalinator provided fresh water. At the end of 58 days, Tori had rowed more than halfway across the Atlantic. But of all the obstacles she faced, none proved more menacing than the fury of the sea. And I'd been through some pretty heavy storms and capsized three times. I'm going to take my word for it, these waves are just a little too big. When Tori did capsize, the American Pearl was designed to right itself. And though terrified, her waterproof cabin kept her safe. A big wave would come over the top and it would spin the boat. And then I'd be upside down for a couple of seconds and the boat would rock and then it would eventually roll back upright. I'm outside and I'm alive! For inspiration, Tori kept a piece of home close by. That little flag on that boat took such a beating, and it was so comforting to look out on deck in the morning and see that flag still there. But the weather steadily worsened, and while we breathed a sigh of relief as Hurricane Danielle passed by the East Coast on September 5th, Tori was brutally engulfed by the storm. 6.30 a.m., um, I'm definitely in something big and bad and ugly. 30-foot waves slammed into Tori's boat, tossing her like a rag doll. <laughs> Mash into the boat, and there would be this chaos that would ensue, with the boat turning and things flying around the cabin. And the last capsize, I took the rib off the top of my ceiling with my uh, back. I was absolutely sure that I was not going to live through the storm. I was absolutely convinced that my life was over. I'm, I'm going to live, I'm going to die on the whim of nature, and um, that's that, huh? Frightened, Tori uttered what she thought may have been her last words. Go ahead and chase your dreams. I mean, they don't always work out right, but go ahead and chase your dreams. you got to do it. Though fear was evident in her eyes and in her voice, Tori resisted activating her distress beacon. And I thought, I can't ask another human being to come out into this storm and get me. I've lost track of the number of capsizes. But after 11 capsizes in 12 hours and a severe shoulder injury, Tori signaled for help. I was so badly beaten that, you know, I, I didn't think I could make it through another storm. The container ship Independent Spirit en route to Philadelphia came to her rescue and plucked her from the churning seas some 900 miles from France. I was fighting back tears because I thought this is the wrong shore and this is the wrong boat. But the folks in Philadelphia gave Tori a hero's welcome. And I was dumbfounded because in my mind I had failed to do what I, I had set out to do. We all face oceans. We all run into those big waves, we all hit storms, and it doesn't seem like you're going to make it through. You will. Chantelle Brown Young is a genuine beauty, but as you can see, there's something very unique about her. The 19-year-old has vitiligo, a rare skin condition where patches of skin lose pigment. Unlike Michael Jackson, who also had vitiligo, Chantel has chosen not to take any medication, embracing the condition that has given her perhaps the most distinctive look in the modeling industry. I don't think I understood that I had vitiligo until I was like maybe in middle school. Um, and that's only because that's when, you know, bullying started for me, um, when kids started to get ruder and meaner about, you know, differences, be it if you were a little bit heavier, or if you were fair skin or dark skin, or if you had vitiligo. So, um, you know, I, I had it from an early age, but it took a while for me to understand that I actually did have something that was um, so profoundly different about me. She was first diagnosed with vitiligo when she was four. As she got older, the skin condition became noticeable. She says she was bullied at school. Kids called her zebra girl. Others called her a cow. Kids called me all types of mean things, cow, zebra, they asked me if they should milk me and all types of horrible, horrible mean things that a kid at that age should never have to hear. 
I never tried to conceal it myself, but my mom, for like pictures and family photos and that type of stuff, would um, blend it a little bit darker with her own foundation, just because she thought it would make me feel more comfortable. Um, but as I got older, I you know, kind of built the confidence to tell my mom that that's not something that I like. I don't enjoy putting on makeup to cover up my skin. It's not fun, you know? It, it's not something that I see my friends having to do, so I don't feel like I should have to do it either. Instead of living in seclusion and privacy, she's decided to enter the most public arena imaginable, modeling. I'm so proud of her for celebrating her own natural beauty. And I think it makes her a great role model for other women who may not even have vitiligo, but who may feel that they don't look like everyone else. To be an inspiration to so many means, honestly, the world to me, because my career, I would say, kind of started with you know, my fan base. It wasn't anyone who kind of saw me and said, oh yeah, she can do this and let's get her to do this. It was more me doing anything that I could and my fans giving me the encouragement to continue to do what I wanted to do. So when people come to me and they say, you know what, you doing what you love to do inspires me so much to do what I want to do, it helps me, you know, encourages me even to do, to continue doing what I want to do. The 19 year old is about to take the world by storm appearing on the upcoming season of America's Next Top Model. My birth name is Chantel Brown Young. Okay. So on the show I go by Chantel Young. They just took off a last name. Um, my alter ego's name is Win Winnie Harlow. So um, I kind of carry her with me everywhere I go. So I just put them together, Chantel Winnie. I believe it was a hope for me to be on the show, but I never really thought it was going to happen. I've looked at um, trying to get on the show many times before, and of course you have to be an American citizen to be on the show. Because I am not an American citizen, I never thought it was ever going to happen, but it did. Now see, you could be flying now. No, no. With a long list of upcoming premieres to dress for, we spent the day shopping in Manhattan with 18-year-old Aliyah. First stop, Saks. Aliyah is a veteran of the music scene. At 14, her premier solo project, Age Ain't Nothing But a Number, achieved platinum status with hits back and forth. And At Your Best You Are Love, which catapulted her to the top of the Miss R&B Diva list, thus paving the way for her recently released double platinum album, One in a Million. In today's music industry, where image is everything, Aliyah mixes her sex appeal with a playful tomboy twist, creating a look that's all her own. So I watch um, a lot of the fashion shows, a lot of the runway models, and see what's the next thing happening and then intertwine that with what I'm doing. Image goes hand in hand with the music, and that's how people identify you. You know, they separate you knowing your music and knowing your style and your image. So that's why it takes me a while to, to put things together, especially if I'm doing a dressy thing rather than a sporty thing, because what you see here is really me, the baggy jeans and skull caps and everything. So when I'm, when I'm doing a dressy thing, I've got to still remain in my image. So. Right. It takes me a while to put something really good together that still looks like Aaliyah. But there is a real difference between the catwalk and life. Can you sit down in the jeans? <laughs> Very elegant to sit down there. <laughs> Just kind of stretch out. Just kind of stretch. You have to kind of slap. It's kind of be kind of cool. Can't sit up. Just right. Gotta, then when you're getting out of the chair, you got to kind of <laughs> come up like that. <laughs> Ready? Aaliyah. Uh-oh. Well, look at that. That coat is mad. I'm feeling the coat. The coat is off the rocker. This is a little different for me. Um, I'm not liking the pants. Really? Actually, you know, it's it's cute, but it's, it's, it's You're not, still not there yeah, yet. Yeah, I'm not there yet. You know what I think it's time for? April, I think it's time to go to Nike Town. Nike Town. I really do, but okay. I do like the coat. I may have to snag the coat. So we went looking for something a little more comfortable. OK, you're 18. You already yes. went to your prom. Is it possible at all to have a relationship on the road? I would say it's possible. I just don't have one. <laughs> I don't have one right now. I don't have a boyfriend. Um, and I can't say I'm really looking. I think it'll come along at the right time. I have a lot of friends. And um, when that guy comes along, I'll know it, he'll know it, and then it'll happen. But um, I am really busy with the career and the fact that I'm getting ready to go back to school. So. I just see how it works. Here. Three years ago, there was this terrible rumor out. Mm -hmm. What is the deal with you and Aaron Kelly? Are you all married or not? No, I'm not married. Um, Robert's doing his thing. I'm doing my thing. He's a great producer, a great artist, who I do admire. And um, there's there's nothing, nothing there at all. <gasps> we are here. This is my place. This is in the New final York. frontier. I'm sorry, Aaliyah. These look oh, really so weird. Now let me tell you something though. 
these, you get the right outfit with these? Thumbs up. The right outfit will be fly. Okay. Last time I bought some shoes, there were the pumps. You know, remember the Y'all, pumps? stop the madness. You had the... Okay. <laughs> Well, we found some fun clothes, just nothing fit for a premiere. I can get this. Which one do you want, girl? I'll get it for you. You cannot see the size and get that April. Uh-huh. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say the secret of life is? Secret, secret to of life. life. Secret to living. To life. To living is just being free, enjoying life. When you choose a, a career, it's got to be something you love, so that you want to get up and do it every day. And you know, you just have to love yourself, love what you do, so you can enjoy life. Beyonce Knowles, the singer from the sizzling group Destiny's Child, hit a real high note this summer. Shazam! You know what you want me to say? It? Oh, God. Shazam! <laughs> She's parlayed a successful singing career into a big screen role in the film Austin Powers in Goldmember. The future better get ready for me because I'm Foxy Cleopatra, and I'm a whole lot of woman. <laughs> <laughs> it was my first movie. I was around all these legendary people, and I learned so much every day, and I laughed every day, all day. She really was on that screen like she belonged there, and I think people really, really, I think are gonna start writing roles for her because she did uh -huh. have such a big impression in Gold Member. Shut your mouth. Now don't think for a minute that the hit movie role, hot songs, magazine covers, and commercials are part of an overnight success story, not by a long shot. Yep, this is Beyonce on Star Search in 1992, performing her heart out. This videotape was shot by family members watching from the audience. The group is called Girls Time, which would eventually become Destiny's Child. But like a lot of stars, they didn't win. When I talked to Beyonce about their, their loss on Star Search, she told me they cried backstage. That was um, a crushing loss for them. What a lot of people don't know is that Beyonce, who turned 21 this summer, has been performing since she was about seven years old, growing up in Houston. Her career has been strategically managed by her parents, Matthew and Tina Knowles. You have to believe. I, I absolutely believe that. I mean, my philosophy is if I don't believe it, I can't expect anyone else to believe it. So I absolutely uh, saw and vision the success that we're having today, and I see and vision even greater success. You cannot talk about Beyonce without talking about Destiny's Child. As a matter of fact, Beyonce doesn't really talk about herself without referencing the group. And what about those constant rumors of an inevitable breakup now that she's on the big screen and planning a solo album? Um, Destiny's Child is not broken up. We still talk every day. We're still going to go on tour and do more performances together. Being in a group is hardly a bad thing when you've sold more than 15 million albums worldwide and won two Grammys. It's very surreal to me. Um, I don't even realize. People say I don't realize, which I don't think I do, how, how much success Destiny's Child and, and I've had and my whole family has had. It. It's just such a blessing. But along with the blessings, there's been a curse or two. Two former members of Destiny's Child fired Matthew Knowles as their manager. He then dropped them from the group, and the two women promptly sued. Destiny's Child also found itself in the middle of another lawsuit, claiming defamation, suggesting that the lyrics from the hit Survivor were directed at the former members. All the lawsuits have been settled. It's actually part of success, lawsuits and they come out of the woodwork. With the lawsuits behind him, Matthew Knowles is building a real family empire. Um, I'm proud to be your sister. Y'all give it up. I love it very much. So much. Inside Edition was there exclusively when Beyonce introduced her 16-year-old sister Solange at the New York City Music Showcase. Afterwards, our cameras were in the dressing room, and the sisters couldn't stop talking about each other. I am very, very proud of her. I definitely just look up to her, and so much that I know I wouldn't know if she wasn't my big sister, so I'm just really appreciative of that. Oh, wow. Day, you say I'm crazy, got no sense. 
She was a 10-year-old with a big voice and a big dream of stardom. But even at this ripe young age, this well-coiffed, well-rehearsed little entertainer was no Shirley Temple. This is the Britney Spears that the world knows now. Full of talent, full of sexual energy, but nevertheless, only 17 years old. She's that age group, she sings, she dances, she grew up doing those things, and she wants to have a good time. And the kids her age want to too, so she's speaking right to them. Rolling Stone magazine celebrated the age of Britney Spears with a sexy cover story. She's already had a number one single and CD, and she's the new face and body of Tommy Hilfiger. This small town Southern girl has truly gone big time. Still, there are those who find something just not right about striking gold selling this sexy image. If I had a 17-year-old daughter, she would not be walking out of the house like that. I think it's a shameful business, 17-year-old girl. But Lori Majewski of Teen People magazine disagrees. Brittany is a very healthy young woman at age 17, and um, I think that's why kids are really responding to her. She's very down to earth, so she can take it a little bit to the edge without getting in any trouble. But critics point to the Rolling Stone photos, shot by controversial photographer David LaChapelle. Well, you know, when, when we shot together for Rolling Stone, um, I was talking to Brittany, I said, you know, we don't want you to just be another one, you know, like another Debbie Gibson kind of, you know, goody two-shoes, because there's always backlash. I said, we're shooting for Rolling Stone, which has an older readership, which may resent having this teenager on the cover. I said, let's do something for them so that they give, give people something to talk about, you know what I mean? And something that sets you apart from everybody else. And let's do something a little bit more provocative. And, uh, and she was up for that. I mean, it's coming from her. Again, I don't impose my ideas on people. It's a collaboration. So we knew what we were doing when we did those photographs. We knew they were going to cause a little bit of a ruckus. They don't quite know it was going to be that big of a ruckus. But I think it was smart because people really learned her name after that. And it really gave people something to talk about. The Spears photos simply leave some critics a bit queasy. But Brittany describes herself as a church-going young woman with good family values. And that, according to Rolling Stone's Joe Levy, explains her success. The girl next door with just a small touch of the devil mixed in. I think she is allowed to be extremely religious and wear hot pants. I believe that that is the 11th commandment. And it's people with small minds that would say differently. Women have been dealing with that kind of issue for a long time and it needs to go away. Hit me, baby, one more time.